Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at Northern Kentucky University and one of the partners in the Northern Kentucky Forum, along with our three public library districts in Boone, Kenton, and Campbell County. Uh, thanks for being with us virtually this morning. Uh, the, I hope you have a cup of coffee and are comfortable uh, and uh, we'll have an engaging uh, hour together and uh, Sometime in 2022, we'll all, all be able to ha uh, be together and uh, have uh, coffee in person for these uh, morning forums. But for uh, the time being, uh, uh, we're um, um, uh, using technology to its uh, fullest. Uh, we'll be together for about an hour and uh, begin with some uh, comments uh, and, and discussion with uh, Commissioner Keene and uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. I will monitor those uh, so that uh, we uh, can get those questions to the commissioner and, uh, uh, and put those in at any time and I'll uh, pay uh, attention to them. The um, uh, uh, Commissioner Keene, it's great to have you with us. Uh, uh, I think the community knows you reasonably well. You've had a, 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 um, quite a run in public uh, life. so. Uh, people first knew you, I think, as a Wilder uh, City Commissioner and then as a state legislator uh, representing the 67th District, which is in Campbell County, uh, and also a role for a time in, uh, at South Bank Partners, uh, which uh, um, uh, is uh, focused on economic development in the uh, River Cities. And we all know particularly for giving us the Purple People Bridge. So uh, uh, the uh, and now as Commissioner uh, for the Department for local government, which I think is a, 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 an important agency in the state that people who are in government know about, uh, but the uh, uh, public uh, may not. So uh, if you could just talk to us a bit of, about what, uh, what it means to be the commissioner uh, uh, for the Department of Local Government, uh, that would be a good starting point. Well, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate being on this morning and I appreciate the, uh, the uh, time that you're sharing with me. Um, the Department of Local Government, as you well know, I was uh, in the General Assembly before this, uh, the governor asked me to come on uh, this job. Um, the Department of Local Government has far reaching fingers throughout all of Kentucky. Uh, when I was a legislator, I represent roughly my little district was probably about somewhere between 38, 40,000 people. Well, now I represent over 4 million people. So the Department of Local Government touches all parts of the state as far as uh, resource, revenue sources. The federal dollars that trickle down from Washington, D.C. into the state of Kentucky that are not earmarked for like transportation, health care, or education fall in my domain. And I have approximately about 65 people that work for me. Uh, they all have different uh, jobs. Primarily, we host um, a lot of grants. We get a lot of grants applications from uh, areas all over the state. And, there, and I'll, I'll mention some of them in a, in a few minutes. But uh, what we do is we grant, we, we oversee those grants and monitor those grants and make sure that the money's spent the way it's supposed to be spent. Um, Normally, our department handles somewhere between 75 and 100 million dollars. That's normal, but we're not in normal. Uh, to give you some kind of idea, I think our last number that I saw was 672 million dollars that this office has put out into the state. Now, a large portion of that was the CARES Act funding, which was 326 million dollars uh, that came through us, went directly to counties and cities. Uh, our governor was one of a handful of governors across the nation that decided that to get this money into the people that most needed it, and therefore we allocated it based on population to cities and counties. Um, it was instrumental, and in one of the important things all government is about is keeping people safe and healthy, and uh, police and fire are big, and EMS are a big part of that. Uh, without these funds, uh, probably a lot of police and fire would have not been able to be paid, which would mean they've been laid off. Uh, so this was allow us to keep everything functioning and everything working uh, and very instrumental uh, into all the communities that we put that money in. Um, then we have all kinds of different pots of money that we use. Uh, primarily the governor, as you well know, is focused on economic development. 
but he also cares about the quality of life of all Kentucky citizens. Those are two of the major things that, that he really emphasizes every day. Um, just to kind of give you an idea on quality of life, um, we just did a grant there at NKU for the Opportunity House. I think that's what's called the Opportunity House. And it is, uh, we get, grant them a million dollars to help renovate that building on uh, NKU's campus in order that we can uh, help kids that have aged out of foster care, you know, that they can live there and continue their education and still have some, some support. Uh, that was very important to the governor uh, because, you know, 18 year old to me is still a child. And I'm lucky I've had two daughters and they're well on their way and grown, but I know how important it is to have a father and a mother around to give them guidance. Uh, and so that was something that the governor was really adamant about that we do. Um, we handle a lot of different grants and things we have. One of the big ones is, is community uh, development block grants. Uh, and they come in all kinds of different forms. Uh, they're usually based on about a million dollars. They can do economic development. Uh, they can do housing. Uh, they can do uh, senior citizens uh, housing. One of the things that, that, that um, the CDBG block grants have done for Northern Kentucky is uh, there can be seen in the development of Newport. If you go through Newport and you see um, the, uh, it's an, uh, Tom Caduli's group, the neighborhood housing group. And what we've done is we've allocated like a million dollar block grant and they have built infilled housing into these, uh, they put building new homes in an urban setting, which is quite unique uh, and helps stabilize the neighborhood. And what we've done in, in uh, Northern Kentucky has been remarkable to say the least. I do get to travel all around the state and it's, it's people really, when you tell them you're from Northern Kentucky, people wanna know What's Northern Kentucky about? You know, so many times people think of the aquarium and they think of, you know, Covington and, and that's all they think of. They don't think that Northern Kentucky is such a large region as we are. But uh, that's that's something that uh, it always fascinates me how we're looked at as just a small little part of the state, not really, a, you know, a major large area as we are. Uh, we do uh, when I was talking about economic development grants, uh, say, for instance, uh, a they're building a factory or something uh, and they need equipment uh, in order to uh, finish out the project. We can, we can buy that equipment for them and uh, lease that back to them. That's some of the things that we can do. We help in public facilities. Uh, we help public services. We fund, uh, as you well know, uh, we help fund the ad districts, Northern Kentucky ad districts. Uh, and we also fund um, the Brighton Center, some of their uh, public services with their recovery centers, men's recovery and, and the women's recovery centers. They're funded to our office. Uh, so we play a, a vital and critical role in a lot of ways that people just don't understand. We are also, one of the other big things that we don't have in Northern Kentucky, which are, uh, I'm, in one way, I'm very glad we, we don't have that problem, but um, we belong to the ARC organization and that's 15 states uh, made up that are impacted by the coal industry. And we're the largest player in that. We get approximately about anywhere from 35 to $45 million a year uh, that just impacts those 54 counties that are what I call the mountains. Uh, that is something that can be used very, um, for not a better word, really liberal. It can be used for uh, for um, uh, retraining workers. We do a lot of uh, lineman uh, stuff and aircraft mechanic uh, training and different things like that. That money comes out of the ARC. Um, we also use it for education. Uh, we, we use it for healthcare. Uh, there's, it fills the gaps that these, these uh, poverty stricken counties can't, don't have the ability to have. Now they used to have coal severance, but you know, coal severance is, is dwindling away because of the lack of mining coal. Um, we do allocate, we, we're a funnel for the coal severance. When they have to apply for their coal severance money, it comes through our department too. So we're very involved in, in the Eastern Kentucky region. We also have an arm in what they call the Delta region, which is made up of 15 counties. And it's, it's basically, uh, it's similar to ARC, but uh, we are the smallest in that group. And we um, help minister their, their economic development 
resources through that. Uh, that's very limited scope. I think we get maybe $3 million a year. It's not very, very much money, uh, but it plays a vital role in those 15 counties that are impacted by the Mississippi River. Um, the other thing we have, we have uh, just, uh, we have the trails, the recreational trails program, which was used with South, uh, with, uh, South Bank Commons to help develop the, the riverfront there. We use that quite a bit. Uh, we have land and water conservation fund uh, that we've used that for parks and things and recreational areas. I believe that we redid uh, one of Covington's parks maybe with uh, tennis courts, uh, I believe it was. Uh, we also have, um, we are a clearinghouse. We work hand in hand with the cities and counties. We do all their training. Uh, they have to have 40 hours of training. And we do all that for them. And we also help monitor uh, their budgets and things of that nature. They, they, uh, so we have, a, we have our finger in a lot of, lot of wells and, and some I haven't mentioned. <laughs> Could, uh, I, I, I take a little deeper dive on some of the things that you said, but I'm gonna go to one quick one on training. Uh, uh, is that uh, training for uh, new city officials uh, uh, in, what laws and so forth. I know, in, you know we're in the greater Cincinnati community and there's been a lot of discussion in Cincinnati after the uh, scandals there about ethics training. Uh, and uh, so uh, is that uh, part of your purview? Yes, we do some of that. We, along with the League of Cities and uh, the uh, CACO, the League of Counties, uh, we assist them in the training. It's, it's mandatory. Uh, they get a stipend for completing the training. Uh, so it, it's uh, it, it's it keeps everybody on their toes because, you know, ethics and laws are changing constantly. And uh, what might have been OK last year may not be OK this year. Right, let's back up on uh, one of the first things you were talking about is uh, Pandemic Funding Cares Act. Um, is that uh, uh, distributed proportionally by population or? Is there discretion uh, at the state level about here are the things we want to prioritize, and so the cities of, and counties apply, and you 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 try to uh, address these priorities? Just what 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 is the distribution model like? Well, the the first one was the, called the CARES Act, and that was based on population. And they got allocated. We had a formula that we worked with the League of Cities and CACO, uh, devising a formula of how much dollar for each person that lived in that in that area. Uh, there's the new uh, part of the CARES Act is um, the, uh, is water and sewer. Now that is really going to be a game changer for us in uh, in Northern Kentucky and throughout the state. Uh, it's geared to help people that um, to assist that haven't ever had water and also to upgrade water systems and sewer systems throughout the state. Now, that's where the, we will rely on the ad districts. The ad districts uh, have people that help facilitate the needs of the area of, of what the priorities are. Um, and they help us in allocating how these monies are spent. The uniqueness of it is, is that as every, every budget city or county budget is, you know, sometimes you have, you have uh, a Christmas list, a wish list, but you never have the money to, to buy the presents. Well, with this, those, those wish lists, those, pre, those projects that you, you couldn't do normally move way up on the scale. So it's an opportunity in, to enhance the whole area. Um, uh, Northern Kentucky is very, uh, they've got the water district, which Ron Levin runs that. He also, I might add, Ron Levin is the chairman of our KIA board, which is very instrumental in water and sewer throughout the state. If you'd like, I could explain a little bit of that uh, since we're on that subject. Um, all the broadband and the water and sewer are going through KIA. They're not part, I mean, even though it's underneath my umbrella, it's, it's a different section of, of uh, DLG. And it's run by a board, uh, which Ron Levin is local, uh, is our chairman on that board. And it is the fifth largest bank in the state of Kentucky. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, but primarily what it does is lend money to uh, water districts and area development districts that need water and sewer projects. We lend money at crazy rates. It's like, uh, I think you can get like one and a half percent interest rate uh, and it's geared to their poverty level and how much their needs are. Um, but uh, 
Ron heads that up and does a spectacular job for us. Would you, uh, since you, uh, uh, your job now brings you in contact with so much of the state, uh, just kind of give us a sense, uh, you know, um, uh, Northern Kentucky doesn't know about us, but we all sometimes don't know about the other regions. What, do, what, what is sort of the state of the infrastructure um, um, uh, statewide? Uh, it, it may surprise some people that there are communities that don't have uh, reliable public water, for example. Oh yeah, I got. I can tell you about that. Uh, we had an area in Letcher County that's in the eastern part of the state, and it had like 650 families that live on the other side of this mountain, and uh, they had the cancer rate there is is very bad. Uh, they drink out of wells, which a lot of them are fit to drink out of. Um, but what we are working on is providing. Uh, water service over to those 650 families. Um, that's people that's never had any uh, drinking water like that we enjoy. Uh, there's a lot of places in the mounts because in the mountains that we run up upon that, or the systems are so run down and inadequate that they 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 just don't produce good clean drinking water. So it's a real struggle for us. The uh... Uh, usually, uh, as we uh, approach a general assembly, uh, everybody has a, a list of things they'd like to see, uh, uh, bills that they hope aren't passed and bills that they hoped are passed. Uh, so I wonder, does the uh, uh, Department for Local Government have uh, an agenda for the 2022 general assembly? Well, we have we have a small agenda. It's not as, as vast as um, the other ones, but one of them we're keeping our eye on a bill that's coming out. Here's a real problem for us, and it raised its ugly head during the pandemic. Uh, we have so many cities that are really neighborhoods, and they still function. They don't have a mayor. They you know they can't dissolve or anything like that. Uh, in Louisville, I think we have 60 cities inside of Louisville. And there's probably about 30 of them that need to dissolve. And so there's a bill out there that's going to make it easier for them to dissolve those, those cities, which that'll be a big help for us and them. Uh, the other thing that we're interested in is uh, we had, as you, you may not, you, you all may not know about, but in the mountains and out in West Kentucky, we have a serious problem with flooding and FEMA sometimes does not cover all the flooding. Uh, there's more need than there is uh ability to meet those needs. We have a section of flood relief money and it's a small pocket of money at, by our standards and it's only six million dollars. We would like to see that double to 12 million dollars because we use the six million in, in one or two floods and shoot we had I think six or eight major floods this past year. We just ran out of money to help them. Mr. When you came to this job, you you uh, uh, having experience as a a, a city uh, a councilman and also uh, work with South Bank as a legislator, you must have had some sense of what it would be like. But there have probably been some surprises. What what have you? What did you not expect uh, uh, coming into this position? Well, uh, I you know it goes back from the very beginning of, of we were talking. I, I went from worrying about 40,000 people to now I have to worry about 4 million people. And they all have wants and different demands and needs that need to be met. And that was, it took a long time for that to, to really get a handle on that. And every day is an adventure. I'm meeting with some, after we get done with this call, I'm meeting with the uh, Mead County Fiscal Court. Uh, and uh, we're gonna talk about some of their local issues that are unique to them mm -hmm. and not necessarily the rest of uh, the state. What uh, um, the uh, uh, some uh, viewers with a little uh, uh, history, uh, uh, little uh, age, shall we say, uh, may remember that uh, uh, at one point uh, uh, Floyd Poor uh, uh, was our uh, uh, director, uh, director at the transportation cabinet, and it was a period of time where uh, Northern Kentucky felt like its voice was louder in Frankfurt than uh, in, in uh, previously. Uh, and now uh, we have a Northern Kentuckian who is uh, 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 overseeing the, uh, this de uh, uh, department. Uh, are you able to amplify the Northern Kentucky voice in uh, uh, Frankfurt? Uh, and what's that, uh, what's that uh, 
I don't know, the results of that, what, what benefits are there? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, there's opportunities that, that especially our, our riverfront and some of the other struggles uh, that Northern Kentucky has. Uh, a lot of people around the state look at Northern Kentucky and they think we're just the land of milk and honey. And it's not necessarily the case. We have our struggles just like everybody else does. They may come in different packages, but I'm able to talk to the governor on a personal level. One of the things that really, when I first came on board, I got an e my first email, it says, it says uh, we're having an executive uh, meeting of the senior staff. And <laughs> I thought, well, I've made the big time. I'm senior staff now. But uh, it, that, that's put me right. I meet with the governor at least twice a week. Um, and I also am on the road with him. Uh, I was on the road with him yesterday. Uh, we were awarding some water and sewer grant monies uh, in central Kentucky. So uh, anything pops up, he'll, he'll ask me about it. The, the governor's a quick study. I mean, he's not a person that, you know, you got to constantly remind about something. Uh, he gets it the first time. All right, I'll stay on that for a minute. Uh, this governor, like no other, has been in our living rooms a lot during his administration because of the pandemic and uh, the, the frequent briefings. Uh, and so maybe uh, uh, we feel like we know him reasonably uh, well as a result of that. But uh, uh, you know him in a, uh, in a more uh, in-person and personal way. Uh, what is Governor Bashir uh, like uh, as a, a person and as a leader from your perspective? My perspective, he's a young man. Uh, I believe he's 42 or three. He just had a birthday, so he's probably 43 years old. And when I was one of the first trips we took um, was on, uh, on the governor's plane. Um, and uh, it was like, he, he was wanting answers to questions and, and things. He's just a workaholic. Mm -hmm. You know, he works all the time. And, and he expects you to do that too. But he's also very compassionate. Uh, he really cares about people. Uh, we were at a function where there were some flood victims and uh, they had lost everything they had. And uh, they were just mad because of, you know, FEMA wasn't helping them or they, they, they needed to vest, they needed help. And I, he walked right up to him and he says, hi, I'm Andy. He said, I'm here to help. He said, what can I do? And he stood there uh, to them, to those people. It was a lifetime. I mean, he, he stood there probably about 45 minutes, just letting them vent and, and uh, you know, getting their anger out and, and letting us see how we can help them. He's extremely compassionate. And I think a lot of people, that's the thing that they, they, they don't understand. He, he really is sincere when he's, when he's getting this information out. Uh, he really cares about people and cares about children immensely. The, uh, uh, in politics, in Kentucky politics, I'll say, uh, I'm sure it's true elsewhere, but uh, I've heard it said a number of times over the years that uh, a gubernatorial term is relatively short. Of course, we have succession now. It used to be just four years, but uh, that it's important to think what is the one thing that I really want to accomplish in my uh, four years. And we have uh, governors that are you know, known for the uh, Education Reform Act and uh, uh, things like that. So is there a central thing that you think that this administration is really uh, uh, would like to accomplish? And I know you, know, you come in and you didn't know you're going to have to deal with the pandemic, but uh, uh, so there is that, but is there, uh, how would uh, the Bashir administration like to see the state change as a result of its governance? I think as you, as you can see is, and his actions, uh, economic development is, is come to the forefront and creating, not just, just creating good paying jobs. That's, that's something that he resonates all the time, but also uh, he's very interested. We have a lot of uh, schools uh, buildings that are in terrible shape around the state and he's got the money to fund those schools and have them rebuilt and uh, reestablish education, make it safer for those children. I think that's something that, that he wants to be known about. Also, uh, you know, the transportation issues, as you well know, this infrastructure bill is going to be coming down and that's going to be, uh, Probably, I'm guessing uh, four or five hundred million dollars into transportation. As we all know, I mean, he wants to, you know, get that Brent Spence Bridge built. Uh, that that would be something that would be phenomenal if uh, we can accomplish that. And I I think uh, 
I think that's something that he would re really want to do. And uh, also our fourth street bridge there in Northern Kentucky, since the riverfront development has happened. I mean, I've taken him down there and we've rode across that, that bridge. Uh, he knows what the struggles are. And you can take one look and see, you know, with that, uh, the, with the double A highway expansion down there and all that building going on with ovation. I mean, it's just, it's got to happen. We're going to have bottleneck and it's going to be terrible, but those are kind of things I think that I might miss something that he personally is involved in, but from my perspective, that's what I think that, that he would want. Uh, let's stay on the Brent Spence bridge for a moment. I think I understood the president to say that when the, uh, the infrastructure with the infrastructure bill, the money will be there if the governors decide to spend it uh, there. And uh, of course, you know, the, in the community, we've begun to wonder, does this mean that it can be done without tolls? Uh, what, do you, are you uh, involved in any discussions about where the, you know, are the odds improved of it now? Uh, how, what kind of co community consensus do we need about what to build and, uh, and whatever is new or different on the tolling question, if anything? Oh, well, I'm, Personally, I, I kind of think I'm like everybody else. Nobody likes tolling, you know, and I think that uh, with this influx of money that we'll be able to uh, to do that without tolling. That's the hope and uh, the desire of the governor. That's for sure. Uh, Commissioner, I'm going to switch to a question from uh, the audience that uh, uh, is um, uh, framed around um, uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, distributing money, people begin to wonder, how can I get some, right? So uh, right. Uh, in our, uh, of course, our public libraries are one of our partners in the forum. And the question is, uh, can libraries apply for funding uh, through uh, the department? And uh, if you don't mind, let's just expand that to uh, uh, how does, uh, who can apply and how do you go about it? Well, you know, it's it's pretty vast in its scope. Um, you know, um, we can apply for equipment and different things like that. Um, we have a website that you can go on and it tells you all about the different pots of money that we have and how the applications are. And, and uh, also, uh, my strong belief is, is that what I try to tell my staff is, you know, when people make an application, sometimes the application needs more work than, than they put into it. And I say, you know, we need to take the time to coach them up a little bit and make sure that they're taking advantage of everything that they have. Um, but yeah, I would think, you know, we do senior citizen housing, we do a lot of things. It's just a matter of finding that, that, that niche, a pot of money that you need to tap into. Thank you. I remind the audience, if you have a question, put it in the uh, Q&A uh, uh, for us uh, and uh, we'll uh, uh, I'll, uh, monitor those and get those uh, asked. Uh, your time at uh, South Bank, um, um, I wonder, uh, and, and since you're a Campbell County resident as well, and you mentioned using uh, the, the uh, 4th Street uh, Bridge, uh, what's your view of uh, how things are going in the uh, the uh, the river cities and uh, of course uh, we've all monitored the uh, uh, when's the purple people bridge going to reopen which it is now and then the uh, the Roebling Point uh, or Roebling uh, uh, bridge as well uh, uh, these old uh, uh, but dear infrastructures uh, that that have uh, that are both architecturally fun to have and uh, but also have become a part of the uh, the livability of the river uh, river city. So, you uh, in your South Bank ro role and other roles have uh, 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 paid close attention to that. What's what's what are your thoughts on how that's looking and what the future is? Oh, I, I think it's it's worked out really well for us. Uh, uh, it's exciting to have had that part of my life. In fact. I, I credit uh, being part of South Bank as as given me the ability to really uh, be able to do this job. Um, you know, sometimes people come in and they've got a project and we've got two or three different pots of money and they're just asking for one pot. Well, sometimes if you look around, you, you, you tap in a couple other pots and you can make something happen. But the vision of Northern Kentucky is incredible. When I'm out talking to people, uh, like I say, a lot of times they, they think the riverfront is Northern Kentucky because they enjoy it so much. But I, I think, uh, 
the future is is just bright for for the riverfront and the cities. People are re realizing what an asset the river really is. Um, you know, they used to run away from the river. Now they're embracing the river and 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 revitalizing these old neighborhoods. Um, I've read somewhere where rental income in Newport is one of the highest in the state. Uh, that's that's saying a lot from when I grew up there. You know. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. And, and, and you know what else is really amazing about the riverfront community? And I use this a lot is the whole thing game changer was when we developed that interlocal agreement um, to allow the six cities to be able to share resources and go together on federal grants. That was a game changer because what that did was uh, that made instead of like the city of Bellevue, which might be 4,000 or 5,000, uh, all of a sudden, the city of Bellevue represents 85,000 because of being part of that interlocal agreement. I think that was the game changer for what we did. And I encourage that when I'm out talking to different counties and cities, especially with water and sewer, I said, you need to get some kind of plan together and see where you want to end up. And, and let's, let's try to use these resources like, like we have up in Northern Kentucky. Water and sewer, are we in good shape on those two things in our region? I, I really, I know, I know we're not, getting water from wells, but uh, what kind of needs do we have that you see and are being asked to respond to? We still have areas of, of northern Kentucky uh, that do not have water. There are not a lot of them like they are in the mountains and places of that nature. So we have, we have some challenges there. But a lot of times that is, is in, in water, uh, you have to not only do you have to have, you have to have the ability to use the water. In other words, you run the water out there for a mile and you, and you only have five homes, uh, sometimes they aren't able to use the water enough that the water kind of turns septic. So there's challenges to that, but we do not have the challenges that they have, uh, you know, in the rest of, of the state. Another challenge that Northern Kentucky has is our sewers, our sanitary sewers. I, I venture to say that probably we've got sewers running that we don't know where, the, where they're at. I mean, uh, case in point, uh, we had water storm runoff down there in the city of between Newport and Bellevue, um, and it was just flooding out there. And uh, we had to allocate a couple million dollars to solve that problem. But that was a problem like a wish list. You'd like to do it, but you don't have that $2 million to make it happen. When I was in the General Assembly, I was able to earmark that $2 million to make that happen. But we have our challenges. And in the city of Covington, will have a lot more challenges with what they're doing. They're completely re reinventing their downtown. Um, they're going to have water and sewer needs down there that'll have to be addressed. So uh, everything in a utopia for us on water and sewer. I remind the audience, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A. And Commissioner, I, have a, I give you a question from uh, the audience uh, now. Uh, you mentioned the Opportunity House, which... Uh, puts us in a frame of mind of thinking about uh, housing affordability and housing need. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, of course, we have some uh, interesting innovations in Northern Kentucky, the Scholar Houses in uh, um, Newport and uh, Covington. And you mentioned also support for uh, neighborhood foundations, the old uh, housing authority in Newport and doing infill housing and some of the innovative work happening through that agency. Uh, but what, uh, uh, both uh, in the region of Northern Kentucky and statewide, um, um, the, uh, what do you see as the housing needs and what's your capacity to uh, uh, help address those? Well, I think one of the problems that we have in Northern Kentucky is having uh, affordable housing. Uh, we struggle with that. Um, that's part of the problems with our, with our growth is, um, you know, you pay somebody. 16 20 dollars an hour you know uh to find adequate housing up in northern kentucky is a struggle for a lot of families uh so we're looking we're looking at that and how to how we can rectify some of that um it's hard to it's hard to live in northern kentucky unless you make x amount of dollars it's like that's why we have some of our struggles you know people in the east they say oh i can go up to Northern Kentucky makes $16 an hour. Well, maybe in the East, $16 an hour is a lot of money. But when they come up here, $16 an hour is no money. And then, then we have problems with housing. They can't find any place to live and uh, the homelessness and, and the different things that we have to deal with. But uh, we're being innovative. And I also sit on 
of the Kentucky Housing Corp. That's one of my other duties. And so uh, I've watched what they're doing around the state in building affordable housing. And um, I think there's some things that we can do in Northern Kentucky to make that happen. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take an effort by not only um, the, like the neighborhood housing folks, but it's going to take an effort by the Chamber of Commerce and we're all going to have to get behind that because it's going to be a struggle for creating places where we can have workers. You know, there's, we have plenty of jobs. We just don't have places for them to live. The, uh, maybe stay on that just a second vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Amazon project, which is this huge uh, uh, project by the airport. Uh, and I've heard a lot of discussion about will there be housing and transportation for workers for that? Uh, are you having, are you involved in uh, discussions on, uh, how uh, Amazon integrates into uh, the local economy? Well, there's already uh, some movement that's already well established between the uh, tank group uh, and they have a bus route that's dedicated directly to the airport. So I'm sure they're working on, you know, expanding that even more and getting workers to Amazon. Uh, Amazon's really kind of unique uh, because if they, they, uh, they're, they're self relying on their self a lot. Um, I noticed when we had uh, just like UPS and DHL and that, uh, we have a program uh, that uh, funds scholarships. If you, if you work in those industries that you can continue going on to a, a school and get a free uh, scholarship. And when I mentioned that to the Amazon folks, when we were recruiting them to come here, they went, we already do that. You know, they're just kind of ahead of the curve on a lot of that, that stuff. The, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, probably just read this question because it's fairly specific uh, and will make uh, uh, sense to you, I'm sure. A uh, uh, source of frustration for SPGEs has been interacting with the Department of Local Government's public portal, which they pay a fee to help support. The portal has never functioned as intended and can often show non-compliance non with reporting requirements when that's not the case. Uh, what's the department doing to address that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I had my staff uh, go over that. Uh, our antiquated system is almost near completion. Our staff has spent the last 18 months working with developers to bring a better product to the Commonwealth in hopes of a better compliance and increased transparency for citizens. We are soft currently, we are soft launching cycle one, which is just the water districts into the system. After they are trained on the 8th and 15th of December, there are approximately 200 in the cycle. And then we're going to launch in February for housing districts. It's it's it has been a real problem for us, and and it's a priority, in fact, for us to get this taken care of. So we're dedicating a lot of time to it. Commissioner, I'd like to go back, if we could, uh, to uh, uh, your interactions with the governor. I asked earlier about uh, um, his priorities and and uh, uh, and sort of your uh, you know what is your working relationship is, but. Also, uh, being a member of uh, the senior staff uh, means that you have an opportunity, uh, you have the governor's ear and a chance to say, here are things that I'd uh, hope to put on your agenda. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering uh, if there are things, uh, you know, when you're uh, together uh, uh, traveling the state and it's, uh, uh, you're able to talk to him, uh, what, uh, in, uh, what do you say, uh, think about this? This is, uh, uh, let's elevate this as a priority. Yeah, and that's, and that's true. I mean, he'll, he's a quick study and he knows a lot more than you think he does about a lot of vast topics. Uh, we talked quite a bit about, you know, the, uh, um, the expansion of the double A connector and how it's impact is brought on the riverfront. And we've talked about ovation and different functions. We've talked a lot about the air, airport, Amazon. Uh, air, there'll be something that he's not caught up on. Um, I usually can bring him up to snuff on it. We also have in our department, we have, uh, I believe it's five, uh, what we call field reps. And these field reps, they engage in the community. They go to some of the fiscal court meetings. They represent our office in Northern Kentucky. Angie Kane is the person that represents Northern Kentucky. And uh, she does a wonderful job for us. And, and if there's things that pop up on the ground that we should be aware of it, Angie's job is to convey that to me. And then I'm to convey that to the governor or to the appropriate people. The, uh, uh... 
I'm wondering uh, if you could reflect, tell us what it uh, looks like now that you're in a, a state role, uh, uh, how Northern Kentucky's voice works. Um, it's funny, uh, here in Northern Kentucky, we often hear people say Northern Kentucky is a step uh, stepchild, but then as I travel the state, I hear people say, well, Western Kentucky is a stepchild or Eastern Kentucky is a stepchild. I'm not sure they say that so much in Lexington and Louisville, but uh, uh, everybody feels their voice is not uh, uh, heard in, in, in Frankfurt to the extent that it should be. Uh, and you've mentioned a couple of times that people perceive us as, uh, oh, Covington, Newport, a couple of little towns, uh, whereas in fact, the three counties together are uh, slightly larger than um, um, Lexington and Fayette County. Uh, so, um, uh, and there's a lot of discussion right now through one NKY and so forth, how to uh, create a, a greater voice, a unified voice. There's a new media effort, uh, uh, Link Media, to kind of unite that uh, voice. Uh, what's that, uh, what's your perspective on how, uh, do we have a, a good voice in, in uh, Frankfurt? Uh, what do we need to, to do to, um, strengthen it. Uh, just, uh, you know, um, I, I remember a few years ago, you, you know, everybody was talking about the Golden Triangle and there out came an op-ed in which it was Lexington and Louisville. I was like, what happened to the other point of the triangle? Uh, uh, so we, uh, we have to work for this voice a lot. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. You can't, you can't let up. Uh, you got to keep the, the foot on the pedal all the time, because if, if you're not out there promoting yourself uh, and you get lackadaisical about it, uh, you'll be in the back seat watching somebody drive the car. So uh, we do a, a really good job. If you fortunately, I've been able to get around the state and see a lot of what these other areas do. And uh, I think Northern Kentucky is just as much uh, a viable has a viable voice. The Chamber of Commerce does a good job. Uh, our ad districts do a good job. Um, we normally don't know enough about how Frankfurt works. Um, and I think that's our problem. Like when I get out and talk to some of the cities in Northern Kentucky and counties, uh, I'll bring up some of these applications that we have and they'll go, you know, I didn't even know we had anything like that. You know, uh, and I think it's just a matter of educating people in Northern Kentucky more about the opportunities that Frankfurt can present. But I think, I think we do a great job. Northern in particularly, I hear more stories from people in the mountains about how wonderful Northern Kentucky University is. Mm. It's, and it is, it's, it's, it's close enough to the big city, but not. So it gives them a whole different feel uh, for, you know, getting out of the mountains and, and, uh, and they love the student center and things like that. But, and I have a lot of people then when they find out I'm from Northern Kentucky, they'll say, well, my grandson's getting ready to go. He's going to go up there and take a look. And uh, is that a good place to be? Is it safe? You know, those kind of questions. Um, so we do a lot, our whole area kind of speaks maybe in different different voices but we're all on the same page what's good for, you know what's good for the university is good for everybody what's good for south bank down there is good for the region it has all has ripple effects and i think uh, we do a really good job uh, we may not think we do but good for us you know never never say that you're doing always strive to do better you know um you are a uh we're uh uh um an active Democrat, uh, Democrat, uh, 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 Democrat in the state uh, legislature and part of the Democratic administration uh, in a state that uh, uh, has uh, is represented in Washington uh, largely by Republicans. Uh, and I assume that you're in a job now where you have to, um, you know, some of the cities are nonpartisan races, some are partisan races, and you have to deal across party lines. Uh, but I wonder if you could just reflect on um, uh, the strength of the Democratic Party in the state and the uh, the role of, um, of working across party lines. This is a seems a very at times very un, un, uncivil moment in our nation. Yeah, un unfortunately, I'm sorry, my phone went off. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a different time now. You know, uh, I can't, when I first started in the General Assembly 15 years ago, well, it's been 17 years now, but when I first got there, um, 
you know, everybody was pretty uh, cordial and courteous of one another. Um, you know, we tried to work together uh, to get things done. Um, and sometimes we stumbled on our own things. But um, I think being from Northern Kentucky gives me a whole different perspective and being a Democrat uh, at the state level. Um, because of, as you well know, there's, there's only really two Democrats uh, house seats in all of Northern Kentucky, the majority being Republican. But you know, you have to strive to learn how, to, what I call play in the sandbox. You know, you gotta be a good partner in the sandbox and you gotta be able to reach out and try to find that place where you can build up a foundation. And I think the Democrat party right now is in a struggle a little bit uh, for its identity. Um, and, but they're, they're working hard on it. And, uh, you know, you've, you've got to, and we don't have a, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but the general assembly happens to be dominated by the Republican party. Um, we, we do not have, uh, you know, a lot of people we can rely on, uh, in the house or the Senate, but so we have to reach out and try to work with, with our, with our colleagues and, and they have needs and wants. And sometimes, you know, we can make that happen if we all pull together. You know, uh, it's a matter of negotiating through it. And this governor's done a really good job of that. He's always talking about uh, bipartisanship. This water and sewer money that the General Assembly allocated to us, uh, that was bipartisanship. Um, you know, and, and there's going to be other opportunities. We just got to, uh, you, know, you know, look on the other side of the fence and see how they look at stuff. You know, and understand your 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 not all, not all the time it is a party a foe. You know, a lot of times you can sit down and if you if you if you really look into what your wants and needs are, uh, like it, it, there's all kinds of different religions. They all want to get to the same place. They got different paths. It's no different in politics, and uh, you just have to learn how to work together. I work I work with uh, Senator uh, McConnell's office when I was at South Bank. I worked with them quite a bit, and that's carried on over to here. Uh, I've had a good relationship with Senator McConnell's office, also uh, Congressman Barr and uh, Howard uh, uh, Rogers. I've got a great relationship with their offices, and uh, we've figured out how we can make things work. Just like I was talking about the flooding, um, you know, that's a real problem in, uh, in Hal Rogers' district. And uh, we didn't get any funding in the last administration to help. And uh, I reached out to Congressman Rogers' office. And I said, you know, hey, we need to make access to $6 million that we, we should be getting and we're not getting. And, and he wrote a letter in support of it. And it happened. You know, um, it, it, you just got to learn how to play in the sandbox uh, and get along a little bit better. Commissioner, the uh, uh, one way that people in Northern Kentucky first got to know uh, um, uh, uh, Governor Bashir was uh, as Attorney General, he was here a number of times on the heroin epidemic. Uh, I remember being at uh, uh, an event uh, and he uh, 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 he wasn't a speaker, or but he, he, sh he showed up and he just kind of stood and talked to people and did a lot of listening, kind of what you described earlier. Uh, as the governor, as a listener. Uh, and uh, I think he uh, uh, built some identity by uh, coming to this region and paying attention to that issue, which is an issue that you've also uh, taken uh, uh, an interest in. Um, and I know we've made some progress in, in, in that, but uh, there's still work to be done. Do you hear any discussion about that at the state level? Oh, yeah, that's that's always on the on the front burner. You know, we have a real problem. And we, you know, not only uh, I mentioned earlier, we fund a lot of the recovery centers around the state. That's part of our function and uh, to help them operate. So the governor gets out and uh, he's very involved in that. He'll go to the recovery centers when, when we've allocated money. And uh, you got to think about it. He's going to these recovery centers and and it, it's not a campaign stop. It's because of, uh, it's just goodwill. Those people are struggling each and every day. And he goes down there and, and, and talks to them. And, and uh, a lot of those folks, unfortunately, are convicted felons, can't vote. Uh, but the governor still reaches out and wants to hear about them. He's compassionate about it. He wants to make sure that uh, that issue never gets put to the side. 
Well, we're about out of time, so we're going to let people go uh, make a second cup of coffee or uh, or maybe even go to work, huh? But uh, before we close, uh, just uh, any closing thoughts for us, uh, and, and thank you for being with us. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I just, uh, I think we're so fortunate in Northern Kentucky. Uh, we've got so much going on. Uh, the opportunities are vast and far beyond most of the state. Uh, and then we're right at the forefront of this economic development boom. Uh, we're just, we're just in a perfect position uh, to prosper and uh, to do, to do better. We just have to, like I say, we just got to keep our, 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 uh, our foot on the gas pedal and stay in the front seat, you know, <laughs> cause that's where the decisions are made. And uh, I think we do a good job and I, I do have to commend uh, the chamber and all the entities uh, on the good work that they do uh, represent Northern Kentucky and how much we respect and appreciate the hard work that they all do. Um, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I really uh, appreciate it and for the uh, uh, insightful uh, explanations of, of how uh, your department works, but also of just taking us uh, uh, inside Frankfurt a little bit. Uh, I want to thank the audience for being with us and remind you that uh, uh, on President's Day, which is February the 21st, we'll have our uh, uh, for, uh, forum with uh, looking at the Kentucky General Assembly with a panel of, of uh, some of our state legislators from Northern Kentucky and hosted by the uh, political, our moderator will be Al Cross, the political uh, journalist that uh, 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 you see on KET. And that's uh, one that uh, uh, in a former life, Representative Dennis Keene participated in. So thank you for uh, doing that. And uh, so we'll be uh, back and we'll be at the Kenton County Courthouse uh, uh, live uh, for that. Uh, 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 that will be uh, uh, something you can come to in person, uh, at least at this point. We really don't know. Uh, it seems like every time we uh, seem to make some progress, along comes the next variant, but uh, we'll try to be in person. Uh, Dennis, thanks again for being with us and uh, uh, good, good luck uh, uh, in Fr uh, Frankfurt and thank you for taking the Northern Kentucky voice there. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody. Thanks again. All right. But, uh, have a good day, everyone.